Metering and figuring out your exposure can be really complicated and confusing, but it doesn't have to be. I'm gonna share with you how I meter for film and digital and how you can apply it to pretty much any situation. Later on in this video, I'll have some examples of everything I'm talking about from a quick shoot I did earlier this week. First things first, this is a light meter. This is my light meter. Um, and this is a very modern one. Since photography was invented, photographers have been trying to figure out the best way to figure out their exposure and understand light so that their pictures came out looking good. The earliest light meters were called extinction meters. <laughs> Basically, you had an eyepiece that you looked through towards your subject and you had an iris or density wedge that you could stop down until you can no longer see your subject and then you knew that before that was proper exposure. That kind of device was popular in the 1920s and 30s and before that photographers had various methods uh, including basically making test exposures and guessing. A lot of really seasoned or well rounded photographers had ways to figure out their exposure, but for the most part, people were just kind of winging it. Photoelectric light meters, like the ones we use today, became popular in the 1930s with the first commercially available one, uh, the Romstein Electrofot. Electrofot? Electrofot? I don't know how to say that. Modern light meters use photocells to measure light, most likely a cadmium sulfide cell that measures the variance in resistance uh, to kind of determine the strength of light. All this to say there's been a lot of technology from inception to get us to where we are today, where we can actually read pretty accurately the strength of light depending on our situation. With a modern light meter like my Sakonic here, you have a lot of features which are very helpful in different areas, but you don't need anything close to as complicated as this to accurately meter for film and digital and uh, do it repeatedly with little to no practice. <laughs> On this meter display, you have the display for the aperture, and then over here is the shutter speed, and then up here in the corner is where you'll find the ISO setting. What I do is I just set my meter for the ISO of the film that I'm shooting or the ISO that my digital camera is set to. Most of the time I'm doing aperture priority, meaning that I already know what aperture that I wanna shoot at, but then I wanna know what the shutter speed I should be shooting at in order to get the correct exposure or the exposure that I want. So I'm not gonna teach you how to use a light meter, but I am gonna show you how I use a light meter in order to get the exposures that I want. Typically what I'm doing especially with C41 color negative film and black and white film is overexposing at least by a stop in order to get enough detail in the shadows. And I'm also metering for the shadows because I'm not worried about where the highlights will fall because color negative film and black and white film, well, most black and white film, will be able to retain highlights well into overexposure. What we really want to avoid is underexposure on film because that's when you get those muddy shadows that have a lot of grain and a lot of noise and they don't look really good. They kind of look like early days visco filters. Uh, it's got kind of like a vibe to it, but it's also not a great exposure, especially if you're not trying to go for that look. The good thing about light meters, if you like that look, you can figure out exactly how to get it using a light meter because when you know how to use a light meter, you can set your exposure to whatever you want. When I say metering for the shadows, what I mean is instead of just sticking the meter into the light and taking a measurement, what that's going to tell me is in order to get the right exposure, I need a specific shutter speed setting to get this light to not be too bright. What I'm really worried about is if my film is underexposed and the dark areas don't have enough detail, if I have a scene, what I'm going to do is find the shadows in the scene, or if I'm not near any shadows, I'll just put my light meter in front of my camera so that the light dome is in the light but facing my camera, and then I'll take my hand and I'll actually shade the incident bulb and that way I'm taking a meter reading in shade. That's gonna lift the exposure for the shadows, making sure you have enough detail so when you go print or scan it, it's not just noisy, grainy, blocky nothingness. It's actually gonna have detail. 
And detail doesn't mean that you can see everything in the shadows. Detail just means that the shadows look like shadows, not black voids of nothing. I've never had a problem with this. I've never had an incident where I've taken a meter reading in the shadows and the highlights are too bright and it's blown out. That's never been an issue. It always works out really, really great that way. Color negative film can handle a lot of overexposure. Uh, if you check out Kyle McDougall's videos, he actually does exposure tests on Portra and other popular color negative films. And he has found that Portra can sometimes take seven or eight stops of overexposure and still look pretty good. Don't be too worried about overexposing your film. You should be worried about underexposing because it's always going to look bad unless you like that look, which some people do. Now with digital, it's a different story. It's almost backwards. Same thing with slide film. Slide film is still film, but because of the nature of the chemical reactions and the way that the emulsion works, it doesn't have as much latitude or enough range of dynamic range as C41 uh, negative film. I treat digital and slide film pretty much the same. Digital, I'm not super worried about underexposure because in post, you can use like the shadow slider in Lightroom and you can recover pretty good amounts of underexposure with digital to a certain degree. I've had one or two stops of underexposure and not have a single problem. Slide film, mm, it depends on the type of slide film. It's kind of iffy. There are times where slide film is really, really sensitive to under and overexposure. And sometimes like with Ektachrome, you can take it two stops over and depending on the lighting scenario, it looks great. So uh, your results may vary. But with digital, what I like to do is I wanna protect my highlights at all costs. What happens is if you overexpose a digital sensor, it's not like film. It's not gonna just let the highlights kind of roll off softly. It's going to clip them and it's gonna be completely gone. There's gonna be no detail there. It's just gonna be pure white and you want to avoid that completely because you can't recover pure white. There's no information there for you to recover. But you do want to try to avoid underexposing too because if you underexpose digital too much, you get digital noise, you get gross digital grain, you get blocky black holes of nothingness. What I'm looking for with digital is exposing as bright as I possibly can without overexposing. A lot of people call this exposing to the right because what you're basically doing is taking all of the information in a histogram and kind of shoving it all the way to the right as far as possible. The theory being that the more light that you give a sensor, the less noise and the better looking it's going to be. You can bring down uh, the exposure a bit in post as long as you don't overexpose and everything will look really good. In practice, I think this is pretty much true. So usually with digital, what I'm doing is I'll meter for the shadows uh, unless I'm using a strobe. If I'm using a strobe, I'll just meter off the strobe. But if I'm using natural light, I'll meter in the shadows and then I'll take a test shot and see where we're at. If it's a little bit too hot, if it's overexposing, I'll bring it down to stop and usually that's where I wanna be. I'm exposing to the right, I'm giving my camera more light, I'm giving my sensor more light, and I'm still not overexposing, so I'm gonna get the best image in post that I possibly can. The best advice that I could give when it comes to metering for film and digital is just try. Try things out, experiment, see what works best for you. Obviously with digital, it's a little bit easier because you don't have to wait for your film to be developed and you can see results right away. I've come to all the conclusions that I've come to because I've tried all these things many times on different shoots with different films and different cameras. And all that experience has kind of like guided me to where I am now. Also, there is a really great article by a photographer named Johnny Patience. I will link to that in the description below. You should go read it. It's a really great philosophy. It kind of talks about exactly what I'm saying as far as how to meter for film, um, metering for the shadows, not worrying about your highlights. Uh, it's a great resource. I came across it a couple years ago and it really helped me kind of wrap my head around metering for film. And I think it'll help a lot of you guys too. I wanted to give you guys kind of a visual of what I'm talking about. So I went out this week with my girlfriend and her friend and we took some very spooky images of them as ghosts. Uh, I shot Portra 400 in my Rolleiflex and I shot Ektachrome 100 in my Mamiya RB67. I wanted to show what both films look like underexposed one and two stops and overexposed one and two stops. Both films do really, really well with overexposure on one stop as well as underexposure by one stop. Where you see things fall apart is with the slide film at two stops overexposed and this is exactly what I was talking about. You get to a certain point where there's just too much light. Uh, you have no ability to recover those highlights because they've gone to pure white and all that detail that is in those highlights have been completely lost. And you want to avoid that with slide film. With color negative film, you can see here with this Portra, 
it had no problem. There's no overexposure in the highlights. The shadow detail is there. It looks really good. Hopefully that gives you kind of a visual indication of what I've been talking about. So to wrap things up, if you make sure that your shadows are properly exposed for film, you're gonna be in a good place. You don't have to worry about highlights nearly as much as you think. Try, experiment, see what you think. If you like the exposures when you're doing that, um, I think you really will. And I think it's gonna help you take kind of the guesswork out of making sure your film looks the best. With digital, expose to the right. Don't let it overexpose. You'll get less noise in your images. You will have more shadow detail. You'll just have a better, more dense image overall. And you're gonna be happier with your results, I think. Also, don't be intimidated by these. These are just very complicated computers. A lot of these features are super, super helpful for people who are more advanced in photography and cinematography. There are also much simpler versions of this that you can get for also a lot cheaper. So if you're interested in buying a light meter, there are tons of options. You don't have to spend the kind of money that this thing costs to get a good light meter. There are lots of cheaper options out there. Thank you guys for watching. I appreciate you coming back and checking out this video. If you guys have questions about light meters, metering for film, metering for digital, or whatever, just put them in the comments. I'll be in the comments section answering questions. Can't wait to see you guys again. See ya.